This is the 8th video in the Edexcel B3 revision tutorial series. In this video we will be looking at communication in animals and looking at how animals communicate with each other. In this video we will look at the different ways that animals communicate with each other. We will look at both mating and parenting strategies of a variety of animals. And finally we will look at the other two ethologist studies which are by Diane Fossey and Jane Goodall. We looked at the first two ethologists in the last video, B3.7. All animals require the ability to communicate with each other. This is communication between different individuals in a group and it's beneficial for lots of reasons. First of all, it can help to keep the group together and if any one animal sees a predator, it can warn all of the others. For example, meerkats who will stand on guard and then make a loud noise if they see a predator to alert the rest of the group. Communication of your mood can avoid unnecessary fighting and also baby animals can communicate their needs to their parents. Finally, communication is often used by predators when they are hunting in a pack in order to coordinate their attack. Animals can communicate in a variety of ways. The first way you need to know is via sound signals. So communication by sound is pretty common and occurs in humans as well through language. For example, I am using a sound signal at the moment to communicate with you. Whales and dolphins communicate using low frequency sounds and clicks as they swim. Domestic cats will use a variety of noises including purring and meowing in order to communicate not only with each other but also with humans and also birds use a variety of bird song in order to declare their territory, attract a mate or warn others about the location of predators. The second type of signal that you need to know about are chemical signals or pheromones. We came across these before when we looked at plant science in B3.6. So chemicals called pheromones are released by an animal to tell others where it is or where it's been. A common example of this is that dogs will use scents in order to mark the boundaries of their territory. They can then say where they are as well as deterring other predators. Other animals can use these in order to attract a mate. For example, some animals such as moths will release a pheromone that can be picked up by a potential mate even several kilometres away from them. Finally, Skunks release a very powerful pheromone in order to deter predators when they are under attack. One of the most common ways that animals communicate with each other is through visual signals. So in mammals, a very common example of this is using gestures and body language. Other animals will use this in order to intimidate others in order to avoid a fight. So for example, chimps do this by staring and raising an arm. By intimidating their rivals, this will more often than not avoid a fight. Dogs do this a lot as well in that they will bare their teeth in order to show aggression, once again trying to avoid a fight. However, if they do get into a fight, a dog will often roll onto its back in order to show that it's submissive. This shows it's admitting defeat and again prevents injury. Humans and lots of species of apes use facial expressions to communicate with each other. We would know what a facial expression would mean on another human. However, chimpanzees, for example, use very similar facial expressions to mean very different things. We will be looking at two examples of visual communication in the waggle dance done by honeybees, as well as courtship routines in order to find a mate in more detail later on in this video. The final type of communication you need to know about are tactile signals. Tactile communication is when you communicate via touch. And lots of animals use this as a way to communicate. So for example, chimps will groom each other, tigers will lick and nuzzle their kittens, and bear cubs will wrestle with each other. Touch is used to comfort, to establish dominance, and to establish bonds within a group. As I mentioned earlier, one example of a visual communication is the waggle dance. The waggle dance is a dance done by honeybees in order to communicate to other honeybees where they have found food. So a bee will find a food source while out exploring 
and then it will return to the hive in order to communicate its location. Using the sun's position as a guide, the bee will then waggle its body in the direction of the food source. The food's distance is communicated by adding extra shuffles to the dance, and it has been estimated that for every 100 metres from its home, the bee will waggle for an additional 75 milliseconds. Depending on the way that the bee turns to the left or the right, tells the other bees whether they need to fly to the left or the right of the sun. The more plentiful the food source is, the longer it will last, and then all of the other honeybees will then have the instructions on where that new food source is, so they can all fly off, harvest the food source, and then bring it back to the hive. We will now look at some work by two different ethologists on social behaviour. In the previous video, B3.7, we looked at the work of two ethologists. These were Nicholas Timbergen and Conrad Lorenz. In this video, we are going to look at two further studies. The first one is by Diane Fossey, who studied mountain gorillas in Africa between 1967 and 1985. So Diane Fossey looked at mountain gorillas and she spent her life trying to work out how they behaved. She lived very, very closely with them. We can see how comfortable they are around her here, which meant that they became habituated to her. To look over habituation, look at the previous video, B3.7. But simply, habituation is when an animal gets used to a stimulus so it no longer is afraid of it. Fossey famously became the first person to be recorded making peaceful contact with a wild gorilla. And there are photos of her holding hands with different gorillas that she was working closely with. She saw that gorillas are very, very social animals and saw that they will work together to search for food sources. This means that they get more food. They will also protect each other from attack. She also observed that in the group there was a very distinct order in the social rank, especially among males. This helped to prevent fights because everyone knew their place in the group. She also saw that they used lots of tactile communication in order to reinforce the bonds in the group, so they would groom each other. The final ethologist you need to know about is Jane Goodall. Jane Goodall is a British ethologist who has spent her life studying chimpanzees in Africa. And in particular, she studied them in Tanzania between 1960 and 2005. Similar to Diane Fossey, she observed that the chimpanzees were incredibly social animals. And again, they would work together to find food sources, as well as protecting each other from attacks from other troops. Once again, the males had a very distinct social rank, with the most dominant, the alpha male, on the top. And again, she saw that they would clean each other via grooming. She famously observed that each chimpanzee had a very distinct personality and they were capable of behaviours such as hugging and tickling each other. These are behaviours that we think of being very typically human, but she observed that chimpanzees also use them in order to strengthen bonds between the group, so they show affection to each other. Perhaps her most famous observation, however, was that chimpanzees were capable of using tools in order to help them find food. We are now going to look at how animals use behaviour in order to find a mate, as well as the parenting behaviours that animals show. Within the animal kingdom, there are lots of mating patterns. Some animals will have one mate for life, others will have one mate for each mating season, while others have many mates. However, monogamy, which is staying with just one mate, is quite rare in the animal kingdom and occurs mostly in birds. In most species, the male takes no part in the birth or care of the young, so once he is mated, he will move on and find another female to mate with in the same season. In some species, for example in some birds, the male will mate with one female each season, although this is not necessarily the same female from season to season. So it may be that that male mates with the same female the following season, or he may move on to a new female. In some mammals, for example in lions, 
A male will have a group of females which he stays with and mates with all of them and he will prevent any other males from mating with them. These females are known as his harem. When a new, more powerful male moves into the area, he will kill the male lion and he will also kill any young offspring of that male lion. He will then mate with all of the females in that group. Finally, as I mentioned before, some animals are monogamous. This means they just stay with the one mate. Examples of these tend to be birds, for example, albatrosses, swans and penguins. So with penguins, the male will stay with the egg through the dark winter when the female is off getting food. Then when the females return, she will find her mate and her newborn chick. This does happen in some mammals, for example, in gibbons. As well as having different mating patterns, different animals have different behavioural strategies in order to find a mate. So most animals will engage in some sort of display that advertises their qualities. This is of particular importance to animals that live in isolation. This means they only spend time with other animals during the mating season, so they have to behave in a way that will allow them to find a mate and show that they are a suitable mate. For example, we have a peacock here showing its feathers as a display in order to attract a mate. It is typically the male of the species that does this display and so the female will choose their mate that shows that they're worthy of selection. This ensures that their offspring are strong and healthy and therefore have the best possible chance of survival. We will now look at four different ways that different species find and select their mate. Lots of animals, for example whales, will make a song or call to attract a mate. It's usually the males who make the call to attract the females to them. This could be the loudest call or it could be the most impressive call. As we mentioned earlier when we looked at chemical communication, some insects, particularly moths, will release a pheromone. This is a sexual attractant and this time it is the female who produces the signal. This is then detected by the male who will follow the trail back to the female. A common display to show dominance is that males will fight. We have two red deer here clashing their antlers together. It is the winning male that will get to mate. Some fights between males, particularly in deers and elephant seals, can result in horrific injuries for the losing male. Obviously this isn't good for the species long term, so in lots of species the fights are often displays. These displays indicate strength and give the weaker male a chance to back away before the fighting starts. The final way that some animals will find a mate is via the use of courtship displays. These are particularly popular within birds. Here we have the great frigate bird, which inflates a large red sack on its chest in order to show off to the females. The male that has the most impressive chest will then get to mate. This is an example of a courtship ritual involving showing off a brightly coloured part of the anatomy. Other animals will do things like posturing or even dancing. Dancing is particularly prevalent amongst the birds of paradise who will even clear an area in order to form a stage to dance on. Courtship displays tend to be species specific. This enables the female to ensure that she is mating with a male of the correct species. The quality of the performance, the posturing or the colours of the anatomy are usually a link to the fertility and strength of the male. Some animals engage in parental care after their offspring have been born. This isn't always the case as some animals will give birth to their young, then leave them to fend for themselves. In some species, however, one or both parents will look after the young in a variety of ways in order to ensure that they survive. This can include teaching them skills, protecting them or feeding them. 
This level of care is usually seen in both birds and mammals. However, some fish and crocodiles will also look after their young after birth. Some animals will protect their young, which can involve the parents staying with the young in order to fight off predators. Protection can also be provided by building a nest or a burrow for the youngsters to stay in. Some animals will feed their young. This often involves one parent staying with the youngsters in order to protect them and the other going out to find food, for example in penguins. However, in mammals, we can see here that this dog is providing its pups with milk in order to feed them and they are also close by in order to protect them and keep them warm. As we looked at in the previous video, we had a look at both innate and learned behaviour. Some animals will teach their offspring these tools that they need to survive. For example, in humans, we will teach our offspring how to dress themselves, as well as how to use a knife and fork in order to eat. Other animals will teach their offspring how to hunt, how to stalk their prey, or even how to open a nut or seed. So why do some animals look after their young after birth? especially as it often puts the mother in risk. Food has to be shared and a lot of time has to be spent with the eggs and the offspring. If the parents protect their young from predators, they decrease their own chances of escaping as well. However, there are some benefits to this. First of all, looking after the young is less risky for the mother than being pregnant. This puts a strain on her body and makes it more difficult to escape predators. If animals care for their young, it usually means they can give birth to an offspring that isn't quite as developed. This means they have a shorter pregnancy, so they spend a lot less time at risk. This is only true for animals that give birth to live young, for example mammals. It also increases the survival chance of the offspring. This means that in birds that care for their eggs and young, about 25% of the eggs will produce adult birds. However, in fish, it is not uncommon for only one in a million eggs to survive to become adult fish that can reproduce themselves. It is important to remember that from a species point of view, it is more important that the genes survive than the individual animal itself. So this will be why an animal will risk death in order to protect its offspring especially if it is protecting multiple offspring as this increases the chances that its genes will be passed on. As we just looked at, looking after your offspring increases their survival rate. We can see here that garden spiders have a large number of offspring per year. However, only a very small percentage of these will survive into adulthood where they can then pass on their genes themselves. We can see as we go down the table, we are getting an increasingly smaller number of offspring with chimpanzees and humans on average only having one offspring per year. This offspring, however, is very likely to survive until adulthood. This also links into parenting behaviour, where garden spiders provide no parenting behaviour, whereas chimpanzees and humans nurture their offspring for many years. This concludes today's video where we have looked over animal communication, mating rituals and parenting behaviour. In the next video, B3.9, we will look at the evolution of modern humans.